Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Whale Fest Monterey 2018 Symposium. Uh, my name is Steve Elzey. I'm with Your Sanctuary TV, and we produce uh, ocean conservation films. It's always an honor to stand in front of the audience that is here. You have given up a portion of your time, especially on a beautiful day like this, and you're going to come in and learn something. And we've had a lot of great research presentations, and now this presentation by Allison Hopped from the Cal State University Monterey Bay, our own university right here, um, is going to talk a little bit about getting that actual research into the classroom, how to integrate marine research into the classroom. R very, very important for now, for the future, and, and we, you've seen how many wonderful things can be brought to our children. So with no further ado, Allison Hobbs. really bright up here, so I might be squinting a little bit. Um, yeah, so I am a professor at, UC, or at CSU Monterey Bay in the Marine Science Program, and so I'm going to talk to you guys both about, you're still going to get a little bit of research, uh, but I'm also going to talk to you about how we sort of integrate that research into classes at CSU Monterey Bay. So I first want to acknowledge a few collaborators. Uh, this is Dr. Fio McKelly, who was my PhD advisor when I was at Hopkins Marine Station. And uh, she has been working on abalone in Monterey for quite a long time. And then I really want to acknowledge the students from my marine ecology projects class um, last year. So these are the students who were in the class that I'm going to highlight during this presentation. Um, and these students really did you know, much of the work when I get to the research portion of the talk that, um, that I'm going to talk about. So my talk is going to be in two different pieces. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of integrating authentic research into classes. And I am, you know, not only am I a professor at CSU Monterey Bay, but I am a Monterey local. Um, I'm one of the first, I'm from one of the first graduating classes from MAOS, the oceanography program at Monterey High School. And I think being part of that program really underscored to me the importance of classes doing more than just, you know, standing at the front of the classroom and talking at students and how it's really important to give students opportunities for hands-on learning. So first, I'm going to talk to you about integrating, you know, not just research, but authentic research experiences into college classes. And then I'm going to talk to you about sort of a case study of one of the projects that I've done where I've integrated um, a research project into a class at CSU Monterey Bay. So first, I'm going to try and convince you that integrating research into classes is important. So the Association of American Colleges and Universities has identified nine high impact practices. We call them HIPs, which is sort of a HIP acronym for them. And, um, and really, integrating research into classes hits three of these, these high impact practices. You know, it's obviously focusing on undergraduate research, having collaborative assignments and projects, and then these capstone courses, you know, are courses where the, the class as a whole is working on a project. And so, you know, by integrating research into these classes, we're hitting three of these high-impact teaching practices. And so course-based research experiences in particular have, have been uh, scientific, you know, through the scientific literature have been shown to offer certain benefits to students. Um, so some of the science-based benefits that we've seen through the, through the literature is that there's increased content knowledge, that students are sort of taking up more of the knowledge that you're giving them, analytical skills. Um, and I think this, is, this should be no surprise, that when you're taking things you're learning in class and applying them to an actual project and having to put into practice you know, the things that some boring lecturer talked at you about in a PowerPoint slide, you know, when you were sitting in class, when you have to actually apply that knowledge to a project, it just makes sense that you're going to integrate that knowledge into what you know much more readily. And then, of course, the same goes for analytical skills. If you have your own data that you've collected, you're going to you know, take those statistical and other quantitative skills that you've learned in your other classes before you took this class, and you're going to, have, you're going to be practicing them and using them in something you know, that feels very and is very real. And so it's going to give you practice and a chance, you know, give students this opportunity to really use these skills they've learned in other classes. So it's no surprise, you know, I think, these two. Um, some other things that course-based research has shown is showing a, per, you know, a persistence in science, that students who take classes where they're doing research in classes or having field opportunities or lab opportunities in a class, 
they show that they persist in science beyond graduation. So they're more likely to go on to fields, which is sort of, you know, that's what we want for our students. You know, I as an educator want my students to go on in science or at least, you know, go on and have a successful career somewhere. Um, and, you know, that's what parents want for their students when they send their kids off to college. They want, you know, if they're going to be a science major, they want them to go on and continue in science. And, you know, and that's what students want for themselves also. They want to be able to graduate from college and, you know, find a job where they're using the skills and the knowledge they learned. It also shows an increase in technical skills that students are able to apply, you know, skills they've learned in other places. They're also learning new skills. So in this project that I'm going to highlight, you know, students went out in the intertidal and they did transects and things. I'll talk to you about those later. So they're also gaining technical skills that are going to help them, you know, have some of the skills that, you know, job that people that are applying for jobs are looking for. The other thing that it confers to students is kind of a clearer idea of their own career goals. So it gives them um, an idea, you know, an, of what they do like and what they don't like to be doing. But beyond just science benefits, there's also other benefits, um, just sort of outside the field of science. Uh, you see an increase in communication and collaboration skills. And again, this makes a lot of sense. In capstone classes and research-based classes, students are working together in groups, and so they have to learn to navigate these group dynamics and working with other students. This also shows that they have higher tolerance for facing obstacles. You know, when you're out in the intertidal and your transect is washing around and not really staying where you want it to be, you have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and so, you know, this is something that confers a benefit beyond just the science classroom or working in science, but just in sort of daily life. Uh, you know, they also have positive interaction with their peers. I'd be remiss to say these were all positive interactions. You know, of course, when you're working in a group, there's going to be plenty of negative interactions also. And I always have my students, you know, fill out a form to evaluate how the group work went. And there's always some complaints and things, but I think that's, so another benefit for, you know, because in the real world, everything is collaborative. When you leave college, you know, you have to work collaboratively with everybody. You're not just only turning in individual assignments. And you're always going to have a coworker or somebody that's annoying to work with. And so it's important to be able to not just sort of introduce those positive interactions, but understand how to deal with negative group dynamics. Um, it also, you know, gives you a sense of ownership over a project. And it's not just a sense of ownership, it's an actual ownership. You know, students are working on these projects that they are part of, and they're collecting the data and doing the analysis of the data. And I'll list career goals again here because I think this is something beyond just science. You know, some students take a capstone or a research level class and they realize, you know what, science is not for me. And that's something that's important for them to learn, you know, before they graduate. And so when they're thinking about, so I think, you know, just in general, when it comes to science career goals or any career goals, having that kind of hands-on experience gives you a chance to sort of try out things before you're, you know, committing to them. So at CSU Monterey Bay, I'm part of the Marine Science Program. And we have a diverse set of colleagues in the Marine Science Program. I'm primarily a marine ecologist. I work on kelp forests and the intertidal. I'm also a population geneticist, so I've done a lot of work with uh, population genetics. We have uh, marine physiologists who are looking at adaptation of organisms to hypoxia and ocean acidification, so that's you know, low oxygen and the water also becoming more acidic. We have people using robotics to explore the ocean. Uh, remote sensing, seafloor mapping, a really wide array of uh, faculty. And so one of the things that we all have in common is really trying to kind of make use of this, you know, place that we are in Monterey Bay, because it's a really unique, biodiverse area where there's lots of sort of a natural laboratory to expose our students and our own research to. And then we try and kind of integrate that place-based sense into our courses. So, you know, one of the classes I teach, not at the capstone level, is a marine ecology course. And as part of that class, I cover, you know, the general topics of marine ecology, but I again and again come back to examples in the Monterey area specifically, because that's where we are, and there are so many great examples here. And so then beyond that, we also, as faculty, we all have our own research programs. And we all, you know, strive to integrate our research program into some of the classes that we teach. So I think this, you know, the marine science program and all of the science programs at CSUMB, this isn't unique to the marine science program. Uh, but I'm in the marine science program, so that's what we'll talk about. 
um, but you know, we really try to highlight the area where we are and its unique biodiversity, you know, put that into our courses and then integrate our research into those courses. And so one of the, um, one of the hallmarks of the marine science and the CSUMB education in general is this idea of a capstone, that all students have to, have to complete a capstone before graduation. And so in marine science, the way we tend to do this is we have these group capstone-based classes. And so students, as part of a group, are working on a project together. And we have you know, a wide diversity of types of classes that we, that we have. We have classes where students are using you know, um, advanced GIS and geospatial tools where they're going out and doing field work and then bringing that data back into the lab and working on the computer using ArcGIS um, and other types of tools. Um, in my class, we go out in the intertidal. We're running transects, collecting lots of data, and then again, bringing that data back into the lab and doing lots of quantitative and statistical analyses on the data. We have classes that integrate science diving, um, and so there's a, there's a capstone class that does diving along the entire coast of California to look at uh, fish populations and count fish basically everywhere. Um, we have a class that focuses on using robotics, and so these students in this class in particular, they're not just you know taking robotic tools and putting them out, they're designing robotic tools themselves. Uh, so I always find the students from this class at the end of the semester are really stressed out because you know, they had to develop a you know, robotic system and then put it into the water to try and collect some data and look at something. So you know, these classes are really taking a project from start to finish. And then we also have a project um, that's really lab-based, and this one is using physiological tools to look at, at potential adaptations of rockfishes to hypoxia and ocean acidification. And this is another particularly impressive class because it's a, an NSF, a National Science Foundation funded project that has been brought into the classroom. So these classes that we offer as part of the marine science program, they really give students a chance to experience authentic, you know, to have authentic research experiences, you know, and particularly the last class I mentioned, the one that's NSF funded, you know, those students are collecting data that is part of a deliverable for a you know, a competitive national, you know, federally funded grant. So this is, you know, when I say they're authentic research experiences, I really mean it. They're not just collecting data just for fun. A lot of these projects are just for a deliverable as part of a grade in a class. So a lot of these projects are contributing to scientific papers. Sometimes students, you know, take the data and run on their own and do their own projects afterwards. They're also getting a lot of technical training. So in particular, things like the robotics class, um, the geospatial class where they're doing a lot of mapping and you know really curating skills that can be really important for when they leave college. And this really you know prepares them for careers in our field. And I think you know this is one of the things that's really important you know as undergrads at CSUMB and at you know at most undergrad institutions there's lots of support and places for you while you're an undergrad. But as soon as you graduate you know the rug sort of gets pulled out from under you and you have to find a job. So I think these types of classes are really important because they make sure that all the students who are graduating from our program have had a chance you know, to really kind of dig into a project. And a recent survey um, of alumni, which is obviously, you know, this was a self-reported survey, so not every, we, couldn't, we couldn't ask every single person who ever graduated, so there's some bias in who responds to that survey, but we found that around 65% of marine science of graduates from CSUMB were in you know, a science-related field. And so I feel like that's a pretty good demonstration of how our students are doing pretty well after they graduate. The other thing that these group capstone classes do is that it greatly increases the number of students that we can reach. You know, only so many students can participate in independent research projects. You know, it takes a lot of time for mentors, it takes a lot of time for the students, you have to be really motivated to seek that out. And so by having these group capstone projects, we're sort of assuring you know, that large groups of students are getting some interaction with research before they graduate. And so I think this is really well demonstrated. We have a lot of students who go on straight to grad school, so this is, these are just a handful of examples. Um, this is Katrin Wendt, who's in grad school at University of Washington School of um, Aquatic Fisheries and Sciences, doing a master's program. 
This is April. She's at the University of Vermont working in biology on a physiology project. Emily King, who's working in Jonathan Stillman's lab at UC, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, Kirby Bartlett is graduating this year, and she is, she's been accepted into the School of Marine Affairs at University of Washington. And Josh Smith, who's working on a PhD with Mark Carr at UC Santa Cruz. So this is just a handful of examples of students who have gone on from our program in the last couple years. But beyond that, we have students who you know, go on to work or um, go on to work or study in a variety of different locations, you know, from sort of the education field. We have students who are teaching or um, in at places like Seaside High School or who have gone on to get teaching credentials, students who are working with uh, the Underwater Explorers program at, at the aquarium. And then we have students who have even gone on to work in the husbandry program at Disney World, um, all sorts of you know, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, and then students who go on to you know, traditional careers like working with fish and wildlife, working at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration with the Fisheries Service. So there's a wide variety of places our students go. So hopefully now I've convinced you a little bit about why integrating research into the classroom is important, how it's important to you know, really catch a wide variety of students and not just the ones that seek out independent research projects. And so now I'm going to switch gears sort of back to the science and talk to you about a project that I did with my capstone class. Um, so this is sort of a case study of using research in the classroom and the specific project that my students did. So here we're looking at persistence of black abalone in Monterey. And so really thinking about assessing the status of the black abalone populations here in Monterey Bay. So in case you've never seen a black abalone, this is what they look like. They live in the inner tidal. Um, they're not as big as the red abalone, so red abalone kind of get to be, you know, dinner plate size. Black abalone are significantly smaller, uh, but they still get fairly large. If you've, you know, been climbing around in the inner tidal here, and, you know, in the next talk, John Pierce is going to talk about all sorts of awesome things from the inner tidal. We're just going to talk about abalone. Um, but if you, they can be kind of hard to find, so lots of people who have spent lots of time in the inner tidal might not have seen them. They're always in cracks and crevices. Um, particularly narrow cracks and crevices. When we go out and do our studies, we always bring underwater flashlights with us so the students can find them easier. Um, you know, you really have to think about, does anybody know what eats abalone? Yeah, sea otters. So sea otters are really good predators of abalone. So you have to kind of think, if you're looking for an abalone, is that crack big enough for a sea otter paw to get in there and grab it? Well, you're probably not going to find one there. So abalone populations, they're herbivores. That means they eat, they eat algae like kelp. Um, and their populations have also you know, been greatly diminished over the last couple decades. And that's through you know, a combination of, F of uh, reasons, partially due to high levels of fishing in the past, but also because otter populations you know, were restored. And so now we have lots of otters, and they really like to eat abalone. So just thinking about some of the things that affect abalone populations, I, otter, I, either, I already mentioned sea otters. Um, so sea otters, you know, they have a huge impact on, on uh, abalone populations. They eat abalone. They're really efficient at eating abalone. And abalone you know, are really tasty, as some of you might already know. Uh, kelp habitat is really important, both as, a, as habitat and also as food. Um, so having lots of kelp around is really important because if you have lots of kelp around, then you're going to have lots of loose kelp that's floating around and that the abalone sort of catch those in their cracks and crevices and eat that, ab that kelp. You know, fishing, so for those of you who don't know, uh, abalone fishing, uh, fisheries for abalone have been completely closed for black abalone since 1993. Um, there is still a recreational fishery north of San Francisco for red abalone. It's a very limited fishery and only free diving. And actually, this year it was closed um, for the first time in a long time. So, you know, the red abalone are, are also not doing great. Uh, but so at this point, the only fishing pressure that you would have of black abalone would be from poaching, which definitely does happen. Um, you know, it's probably not a super common issue. Um, but when I was a grad student at Hopkins Marine Station, we did find somebody once in the inner tidal at Hopkins, which seems very brazen, given that you know it's a gated area, full of marine scientists who are working out in the inner tidal. You'd think that that's the last place you'd want to try and poach abalone, but maybe you know, 
right under people's noses where nobody expects it is the way to go. But uh, there was a grad student who found somebody with a bag of about eight black abalone, and, but they dropped them and ran. But it does mean that it does, it must happen. Um, but it's probably not a huge impact at this point. Um, climate change is also taking a toll on abalone through both temperature increases and, um, and ocean acidification. You know, abalone form these shells, so there is a possibility that they're going to be impacted by ocean acidification. And particularly as the temperature warms, that's gonna, that has effects on kelp, which I already mentioned are really important. And that's probably one of the big things that's affecting red abalone populations in Northern California, is these increases in temperature, which are affecting kelp plants, um, and then leading to reduced amounts of food. The other thing that temperature increases can do is have impacts on diseases. So abalone are also impacted by withering foot syndrome and other diseases. And withering foot syndrome has primarily been an issue in Southern California where the water is warmer. But there is some incidence of it you know, in these other areas as the water is warming. And so here you can see this picture of an abalone shell. And normally when you look at the underside of an abalone, that foot takes up the whole shell. So you can see here, you know, withering foot syndrome is very descriptive in its name, that basically the foot is smaller. And the reason why this is such a problem is that as the foot gets smaller and smaller, because of the size of the shell, eventually the abalone can't hold on to that rock that it's stuck to, and so it's going to fall off, which then, of course, leads it very vulnerable to anybody eating it, not just sea otters. And then there's also competition with other herbivores, things like sea urchins. And so sea urchins and abalone have the same food preferences. They're both eating kelp. Um, sea urchins also have the capability to mow down areas of kelp and kind of make things move from areas of kelp forests to what we call urchin barrens. And this is something we are starting to see more and more of in here in Monterey area where areas that were very lush kelp forests are now looking more like urchin barrens. And so that means that not only are they competing for the same resource, but the urchins are sort of, you know, really de can really decimate kelp forests in some areas, which takes away the food or one of the food options for abalone. So, um, you know, one of the things we have done to protect black abalone populations is thinking about different fishing regulations. There have been various marine reserves that have existed around the Monterey Peninsula since the 1930s. And then also in 1993, the entire black abalone fishery was closed. So essentially now on the Monterey Peninsula, every area is a, is a marine reserve because th no fishing is allowed anywhere. Uh, this picture, this mound of abalone shells, is actually from Baja, California, where I did my PhD work. And in Baja, California, that this is one of the rare areas where there still is an economically viable fishery for abalone. But one of the things they don't have in Baja, California, that we do have here are otters. There are no otters in Baja, California. So it makes a big difference because there's not nearly as much predation of abalone. You know, I was really uh, surprised when I first started working in Baja, California, doing a lot of diving. When you go diving there in areas where there are lots of abalone, it looks like people just kind of threw them as dinner plates all over. They're not confined to these you know, small cracks and crevices because there are no otters. They don't have to worry about that part. Their main predators are the abalone divers from the Mexican fisheries. And then in 2005, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, then Fish and Game, created the Abalone Recovery and Management Plan. And this management plan had three criteria for declaring abalone populations as recovered. And so the first criterion was that there had to be a large size distribution, so that you had you know, lots of small abalone and lots of large abalone, but in particular, that at least 25% of the abalone would be greater than 12.7, which was the old legal size for abalone. And one of the reasons why these large abalone are so important is that the basically, you know, all abalone, as you get bigger, abalone are producing more babies. But this isn't a linear relationship, that large abalone are producing exponentially more numbers of babies than smaller abalone are. So these big abalone are really important for persistence of the population. The second criterion was that minimum densities of abalone at a site had to be at least 0.2 individuals per meter squared. So that sounds really small, um, and it is. It's not a lot of abalone in an area. Um, but the reason why this is so important is that when abalone reproduce, they're what's called broadcast spawners. So they're putting their gametes into the water column. The females you know, have eggs that go into the water column, and the males have sperm that go into the water column. 
and those gametes have to find each other in the water and to fertilize. So if you have really low densities, if the abalone are really spread out and there aren't very many of them, then they're gonna have a really hard time having those eggs and sperm find each other, and so fertilization success is gonna be really low. So that's where this, this, um, this density comes from. Um, the second, or the third criterion was that densities have to be at least 0.66 individuals to have levels of abalone that are, that are sustainable for fishing. So they had two different density, one just for thinking about recovery and persistence of abalone populations, and the other for thinking about if we were to ever open up the fishery again. So here, you know, this talk, or the project that my students worked on was thinking about persistence or resilience of black abalone populations in Monterey revisited. And the reason why we say revisited is because there was a study um, so when I was a technician in Fio McKelly's lab before I started grad school, I participated in a project that looked at persistence of abalones across marine reserves in different areas um, in, in Monterey area. Um, we went out and did a lot of surveys looking at where there were abalones, and this paper looked at both black and red abalone, but I'm only going to talk to you about the black, uh, the black abalone results. So what this project found so just to orient you to this graph, this is a graph looking at on the y-axis here, on the up and down, is looking at the, basically the density of abalone, the number of individuals per meter squared. And then across the bottom is how long the site has been protected. So you can see Cannery Row. So this study came out in 2008, but the data were collected between 2002 and 2005, which tells you something about how long it takes to get a scientific paper published. And so you can see is that Cannery Row and Sobranis, these had been protected basically since the abalone fishery had been closed, but then there were other areas that had been protected for a lot longer. And so what you can see here is if you look at how many abalone there were at each different site, there's a lot of variation. But what you see is that the sites that have been protected the longest, they don't have the most abalone. You might expect that these areas that have been protected for a very long time would have the most, but that's not necessarily what we see. So, you know, but all of the sites had been protected for up to 10 years, and so it doesn't seem that there is an effect of duration of protection on the number of abalone that are there. So the other thing that got looked at as part of this study was the size distribution of abalone. And so uh, just to orient you guys to this graph, so on, this, on the up and down axis, we have a number of individuals, so number of abalone that are a certain size, and along the side are size bins. So on the left, there are really small abalone, and on the right are really large abalone. So I'm gonna show you histograms from two different types of sites. One, so the white bars are where there's limited take because everywhere is closed to take, but some areas, you know, are just open sites. And so there could be a fair amount of poaching going on at those sites, we don't know. And then the black bars are areas where there's pretty good enforcement. You know, think places like Point Lobos where, you know, the public is only allowed to go to so many places, things like Hopkins Marine Lab, where even though I told you the story about poaching at Hopkins Marine Lab, it's, you know, presumably a pretty hard place. You know, it's not where you would pick if you were gonna go poach abalone. So what you can see here is the size distribution across these sites. And what I want you to see is that these black bars, you have higher levels of those larger abalone. So we didn't really, the study that, we, that my students were re-examining, they didn't really look, uh, or they didn't really see any change in density, that there weren't more abalone in the longer duration reserves, but there were bigger abalone in places where it was harder to take abalone. So as part of my capstone class, um, my students had the question of, have black abalone sizes and densities changed since the 2005 study? So basically, you know, I like to think about it as this was, you know, 17, 15, how many years ago? Like almost 15, not quite 15 years ago. So in some ways, an entire generation of abalone has grown up since this original study was done. And my students were particularly interested in you know, how are abalone doing in relation to those fish and wildlife criteria for recovery? So we had four sites that we went to. Um, we visited Hopkins Marine Station, and that was the one that had had the longest level of protection, Carmel Bay, Point Pinos, and Cannery Row. And Cannery Row had the shortest level of, of uh, the shortest duration of protection. 
Um, and so these were the four sites we were able to visit as part of the site. When we went to each of these sites, we did 30 meter transects. So my, the students would lay out a transect line of 30 meters, and then students would work in pairs to look for abalone on either side, a meter on either side of that. So they had to work really slowly, looking at all the cracks and crevices. They also, as part of those transects, did a habitat survey. So they looked to see how many cracks and crevices they were. They measured them so we could assess the quality of those cracks and crevices. And also, you know, it was their sand habitat or boulder or cobble. And the reason why this habitat survey is so important is because when we see differences in abalone populations, we want to know it's not because one site just had better habitat. You know, that there were actually differences between the number of abalone. And then we also did 80 minute time searches. So to do this, we would divide the area into different um, places. And then two students would work cooperatively together looking for all the abalone they could find in 80 minutes in that area. And the reason why these time searches were so important is because one of the things we wanted to look at was size structure. And if you've ever been out tide pooling and looking for abalone, one of the things you may have noticed is that they tend to be pretty rare. There are not a lot of them out there. And it's really common on transects to find lots of zeros, you know, that you don't find any abalone on a transect. And so if you're only looking at the sizes that you collected from the transects, you don't have very many abalone to work with. So when you are working where you're not, on, you're not restricted to a transect, but you can just sort of, you know, run all over, you know, run very carefully, trying not to slip, as I tell my students, uh, but you can kind of scamper maybe all over the intertidal and look at the habitat that you know they're more likely to be in. So in those types of time searches, we get way more abalone that we measure. Um, so these are the four sites we went to. Um, and these are some images that were prepared by my students. And so you can see at Hopkins, Point Pinos, and Cannery Row, and Carmel Bay, the red lines that you are pretty, they're pretty thin. Uh, but those red lines are the transects that we collected. And so this is just another example of students using skills they learned in other classes. So all CSU and B marine science students have to take a GIS class. And so I don't know how to make these maps. This isn't something I know how to do. I don't use GIS at all. Um, but this is something that, you know, the students are taking skills they've learned in other classes and applying them to these research-based classes. So this is a chance for them to practice these skills and you know, some of the students are better at the GIS skills than others, uh, but it's also an opportunity for students to learn from each other how to do these things. So first, uh, so this is an example of one of the transects. You can see it, you know, it's, we, when I talk about laying out a 30 meter transect, it sounds like this nice, perfect linear line. Of course, when you lay that on top of the inner tidal, it's much more complicated than that. There's lots of ups and downs and things you have to work around. Um, so the first question was looking at have densities increased. So we went out and we went to these four sites that had been surveyed by this previous study and we used the same techniques they did using these 30 meter transects. And what we found is that by and large, you know, we found that densities were maybe slightly lower. They were only significantly lower at Carmel Bay. At other sites we found fewer abalone but not, you know, not significantly fewer abalone. And just to remind you of the, the two criteria that had to do with densities for the abalone recovery and management plan. So criterion one was 0.2, meter, or 0.2 individuals per meter squared. And so you can see that none of the sites are hitting this criteria. And then the 0.66 for opening a fishery. And obviously if none of them are hitting the lower criteria, none of them are hitting the higher criteria. So we see that you know abalone don't seem to be hitting these two criteria from the abalone recovery and management plan. So then we also measured sizes of all these abalone. And so here, this is what's called a box plot. So you can see the amount of variation at each site. And for the most part, we found that sizes of abalone at each site were relatively similar. We were only able to do the time searches at three of the sites. We weren't able because of weather problems. Um, and also, you know, the confines of working within a class semester system, you know, we didn't have unlimited time. Um, we only found that there were, we found there were bigger abalone at Carmel Bay, but otherwise the size structure was relatively similar to what had been found before. But the interesting thing is if you think back to that histogram I showed you before of the size distribution of abalone, 
the previous study had found that the places that had more strict enforcement, you know, places like uh, Hopkins Marine Station and Point Lobos, or places where you have to go through private property to get to the intertidal, that they had more bigger abalone. Carmel Bay was not one of those sites. You know, Carmel Bay, if you've ever gone to the beach there or gone to the intertidal there, you know, anybody can just walk in there. Um, you know, it might be a good place to try and poach some abalone. I'm not recommending that, obviously. Um, but, you know, it, maybe if you were trying to, you know, just go somewhere with no enforcement. So Carmel Bay was not one of the sites in the previous study where they saw bigger abalone. So here we saw that the size had shifted at Carmel Bay to be bigger. So it kind of gave us an indication that maybe that one, the one result they found from that previous study of more bigger abalone where there's stricter enforcement, that maybe that might not be persisting over time, which is a good thing. Uh, because it, you know, it shows that perhaps now these sites that have had more open access have had time to catch up now that everywhere has been closed. So overall, we found really minor changes in abalone populations. We found that there were lower densities at Carmel, but also there were larger sizes at Carmel. And so it's possible if you think about egg output, you know, which is a really important thing for persistence of a population, it could be that the amount of eggs and babies being produced at this site could be uh, relatively steady because you have fewer abalone, but you have more of those bigger ones that are producing way more babies. And we didn't see any more that uh, stricter enforcement led to larger abalone. And so this was the one thing we found that was different from the first study, which sort of suggests that maybe, you know, like I said, the time between these two studies was about equal to a, an abalone generation. And so it's possible that as a generation of abalone has grown up, that we've had more of these larger sizes in the more open access areas. And then as far as the recovery um, criteria put out by Fish and Wildlife, you know, we see again, just like the other study, that none of these criteria are met. You know, no site had over 25% of most of large abalone. Uh, Carmel Bay was getting close to that, but not quite. Uh, no site had densities over 0.2 individuals per meter squared and no site reached densities over 0.6 individuals per meter squared. And I do think, you know, but at the same time, so that sounds really doom and gloom, but at the same time, the abalone are still there. So their population clearly is persisting. Um, you know, we didn't see major declines across areas. We did still go out and find abalone at these sites. And I really think, you know, one of the things that we have to remember is that when we have anecdotal data about how high abalone populations used to be before fishing. But a lot of that data is before otter populations recovered. So we don't know a lot about how, you know, abalone populations looked when there were otters present before high levels of fishing. So we don't, we don't really know what recovery of abalone does look like. And so I think it's, it's a hard thing for us to figure out because we do have otters now. We obviously, you know, one solution if we want to protect abalone would be to get rid of otters, but that's not something, you know, any scientist is going to advocate for. Otters also play a really important role in eating sea urchins and keeping our kelp forests healthy. So there's also, you know, that's a really important thing. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's really hard to say what exactly recovery of abalone should look like. And then, you know, as far as um, future research goes, so this is a, a project that I'm continuing to integrate into my capstone level classes. So this year, uh, last year, we, we surveyed these four sites, Point Pinos, Hopkins Marine Life Refuge, Cannery Row, and Carmel Bay. Um, one of the limitations we had last year, so obviously integrating research into classes has lots of limitations, um, mostly time structure limitations. You know, students are taking a full load of classes, and I think, and most of the students at CSUMB are also working oftentimes full time. So I think that they don't have unlimited time to work on things. Um, and last year in our class, the class was in the morning and all low tides were in the afternoon. So that meant that every field trip had to be outside of class time. So this was sort of a logistical nightmare that the students took on themselves. You know, I spent the greater part of the beginning of this talk talking to you about how it's so important to give students ownership of projects. And so this was, we had this crazy Google spreadsheet of all the low tides and when people could come when. And it was really a student-driven process of deciding, you know, I said, these are the dates I can go, and then people had to assign themselves to different dates. 
But this year, I was able to ensure that the class would be in the afternoon when there are low tides, so all classes overlap with when we have the, you know, every other week low tides. So I'm hoping we're gonna be able to get to more sites. So for sure, we're gonna look at the same sites we went to last year, but also hopefully adding in Point Lobos and Soberanis, which are both also state parks. So it would be nice to see what happens there. So I think you know this year, hopefully we'll collect even more data. Um, you know, we'll also have an opportunity to do more training with the students before we start doing data collection. And so you know, I'd really like to acknowledge my students from this class last year. You know, like I said, this was really their project. Um, and you know, they collected the data and they did the analysis and they also presented this research at the Capstone Festival last spring at, CSU, at CSUMB. And with that, I'll take any questions. So, uh, so he asked about farming and using aquaculture to reintroduce abalone. So you definitely can try. So we do have an abalone farm here in Monterey. It's a red abalone farm, not a black abalone farm. Um, you definitely, it's something that can be tried. One of the, oh, I don't think it, I don't think it is being tried. It's not being tried here. It is being tried in Baja, California. So in Baja, California, where they have, um, a, an economically sustainable pop, or fishery, they do every fishing cooperative in Baja California has a, basically a small little hatchery and they outplant small abalone. It's really unclear how successful it is. Um, it's really unclear if it's something that just makes them feel really good or because it's really hard to know, you know, they're outplanting abalone that are like this big. And so it's really hard to know how many of them are surviving and they've tried doing tagging experiments, but to get abalone, you know, up to like a size that you consider to be what you see in the intertidal, that takes, you know, a decade. And so farming isn't a super efficient way to try and do it. Yeah. Who's, yeah, for the subtitle. Yeah, and I, I, th I think that's largely what they found. So I worked closely with Baja, uh, in, in Baja, California with abalone fishermen. So I've, I've worked more with the fishermen side of it in Baja than I have in California. And it, it seems like in many ways it's something that they're doing to make themselves feel better rather than it actually being really useful. The other issue with using hatcheries is that you know, I'm also a population geneticist, so I didn't talk about population genetics at all, but one of the potential issues with using hatcheries is that you're using a very small number of parents, and so you're really, you can potentially be lowering the genetic diversity of the population, which then essentially makes them more vulnerable to things like diseases and things in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she asked if basically if people remove the abalone from the rock, if it can be put back and survive. And the answer is, of course, it depends. You know, if they can often be put back, um, you know, like when, so when the fisheries in Baja California use their, their hatcheries or their sort of aquaculture, they're taking, you know, they're removing abalone from the rocks and then bringing it into the lab and those abalone do survive. So it depends on how much damage happens to the shell. If the shell gets, you know, really damaged, then that's not going to be good for them. But or if they were then sitting out for a really long time, then that would be a problem. But they can often be put back. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah, John Pierce could probably answer better than me, but I, th I think it's a little bit of, of both. So we have in kelp forest what's called alternation of stable states, and that you have both the kelp forest and the urchin barren are both stable states. And so there are positive feedback loops that exist within each of those to keep them stable. And, you know, so there's a lot of theories that I've heard from various researchers around here about why there are so many urchins right now, you know, and... Um, one person I've talked to has thought they've just been here all the time. They've just, they're just coming out now. 
And then, or because, you know, there are oftentimes you can't see them. You know, they're really deep in cracks and crevices. And urchins are, I mean, they're really tricky. They can shrink their tests. They can survive on very little food. So they can kind of be dormant almost in a population for a long time and then kind of come out. Um, but, or there's, you know, maybe, you know, with El Nino events, you have current reversals. So you might get, you know, more urchin larvae coming up from the south. But the... The increase in population of, ur of urchins predates the, the last El Nino event. And you know, with the Northwester, with the blob that was in the Northwest, we had a lot of warmer water up here persistently, and so that could be part of it. I mean, I think there are, you know, there are, there are definitely examples of urchin barrens in Central and Northern California in the past. So I think you know, some of it is, it's not unprecedented, but it's definitely happening at a higher level now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the things that with an urchin barren, you'd think that the urchins are sort of shooting themselves in the foot because they're getting rid of all their food, but they can live on very little. So an urchin barren can be persistent for a really long time. And definitely, you know, I, I grew up here in Monterey. This is where I learned to dive with lots of kelp forests. Then I went to undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, and I was blown away at seeing urchin barrens sort of really for the first time when I was working as a diver there. Yeah, and there are no otters there. Yes, exactly. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for listening. <laughs>